Oh, well, well, well. Look who clicked on this video. So you want to see what books I'm getting rid of, you dirty pervert? Welcome back to my channel. I'm Charles. Like this video, I dare you. <laughs> if you didn't know, my channel has recently experienced a renaissance. <laughs> No big deal. And I thought, what better way to celebrate my newfound booktube fame than getting rid of books? If you happen to love or even own any of the books I'm getting rid of, drop a comment, let me know, and know that I hate you. Don't worry, though. I've saved you all the pain of taping myself looming over my bookshelf and manhandling my books like an ape. See my bookshelf tour video. And I've already pulled all the books we're getting rid of. All of the books of which we are getting rid. We're also doing a book haul because I was sitting on my porch, which doesn't have any furniture, so I dragged out a dining room table chair and a box of books I'd been meaning to get rid of for months now. And I used the books as a footstool, which is, of course, the best and most use I'll ever get out of them. This is the box of books. It's full. We are getting rid of a ton of books. Anyway, so I was sitting on my porch, my feet kicked up on these books, my ass getting numb from my dining room chair, and I was reading a book for a video that was supposed to come out today, but I quickly realized that I didn't have time to finish all the books for that video and get the video made in time, so what can you do? Well, I did a pivot, a plot twist, if you will. I pushed that video back a week, and I'm putting that damn footstool to work. I'm crouched on my floor right now. I hope you like the change of scenery. I hope it's worth me having a numb ass for the rest of the day. Um, let's get into the books. I barely even remember what books I'm getting rid of. We're just gonna go through the books. I'll tell you why I'm getting rid of them. The first book I'm getting rid of is The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and other stories by Robert Louis Stevenson. I think he did Treasure Island. Maybe I'm making that up. Did he? He did do Treasure Island. Thanks, Google. Yeah, I bought this at a thrift store. It was at the Goodwill bins slash outlet location, which if you don't know what that is, it's a way by the pound thrift store. It was featured in my used book shopping video. I'm getting rid of this because I got a different copy of The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and it's just that book, or rather novella, because it's only like 90 pages or something like that. The story itself is very short and may or may not be featured in a video coming out in a week. Stay tuned. Side note, I'm pumped for that video, so. But yeah, I really love the copy that I got. I do like these Barnes & Noble Classics copies. I think they might have retired or be in the process of retiring these. Which is really sad because I used to not like them, but I've kind of come around to their like dowdy appeal. They're just kind of like ugly, but in a pleasant way. I don't think I said this, but the reason I'm getting rid of so many books is because I want to read more. And in 2023, I've come to the realization or kind of just actual acknowledgement that I'll never read all of the books I want to. And I want to read a lot of books. <laughs> I love books. But there are just books I would much rather read than the ones I'm getting rid of. Yeah, I would rather reread The Secret History or The Little Friend over and over and over again than ever pick up any of these books. I want to have read more of my bookshelf you know. Um, next book. This is Mole Flanders by Daniel Defoe. I bought this new from Barnes & Noble. I kind of like the cover. Like I said, these Barnes & Noble classics covers <laughs> They're kind of really stupid, but I was initially thrilled to read this. I think it's about a prostitute. How could you not want to read a book about a prostitute from the 18th or 19th century? Oh my god. It says celebrated as a masterpiece of characterization by E.M. Forster. I might have to eat my words and keep this novel. I didn't realize that E.M. Forster, one of my favorite authors of all time, loves this book. I'm actually reading a collection of essays by E.M. Forster. It's like a compilation of lectures he gave and essays he wrote, and then they were all compiled into this one book. And he wrote, or he delivered a lecture on Virginia Woolf at Oxford or something, and that convinced me to pick up a Virginia Woolf book, and I'm really looking forward to reading it, but I trust E.M. Forster. So I guess we're like starting the video out with two lies because I actually have a different copy of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and I think I might hold on to Mole Flanders. Oops. Um, following it up, ironically, with an E.M. Forster book. This is A Room with a View, which I haven't read yet and I'm pumped to read. The reason I'm getting rid of this is because it has someone's name on it. 
and that kind of pisses me off because I don't like this obscenity on my books. I get pretty, I get pretty tight-assed about when people defile books. I don't know. I'm split, but I, I certainly don't want someone's name on it. Um, how do you guys feel about buying used books that are annotated. I actually opened this in a haul video from like months ago and you can like watch as my face drops in realization that it was um written on. I was particularly upset because Barnes & Noble doesn't sell this copy anymore and hasn't for a while I think so I had to scour eBay and buy it and when it came and had this name stamped on it I was like very upset but no need to worry. <sighs> I bought it again on eBay, and this one is in much better condition, and it doesn't have someone's name on it. So yeah, it's the exact same book, minus being defiled. I probably should have just, like, sucked it up and kept this book, but... The next book we're getting rid of is a book I bought brand new off the publisher's website, and I'm super excited to read. It's Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. I love the publisher Vintage. They usually publish a lot of books that I end up liking. I know they publish The Secret History and The Little Friend. They publish Brett Easton Ellis' books. They publish a lot of, like, literary fiction stuff that's fun. I think this is a very new edition. They've started doing these kind of whimsical classic reissuings. And when I bought this, I really liked it. I like this woman on the front. And Penguin Deluxe Classics has started reissuing, or has reissued a lot of classics in these like very whimsical cartoonish characters and they have the deckled edges you know what i'm talking about if you frequent barnes and noble and if you don't look next time i don't think i have one but i think that covers like these and like the penguin deluxe edition classics while fun and silly kind of bastardize the the text like i get that the marketing scheme is trying to get <laughs> youthful kids like myself to pick up classics that I don't think sell as well now, but I don't know. It feels very incongruous to a book that's centuries old. I'm not a fan. So I found this at a thrift store. This is just a vintage-ish Oxford world classics. I paid like 50 cents for this and I like it a whole lot better than the new and silly version. Someone will find this and love it. Oh my God. The next book I'm getting rid of is also Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. I'm, I know I'm neurotic. I know I'm like seriously neurotic. I can't, I don't know, I can't stand, I can't stand an ugly cover. I'm very particular about which editions of books I want and how I want their covers to look. And also I'm like too BPD to ever make up my mind. And so I just kind of like buy tons of books and keep buying different editions until I eventually read the book and the edition that I read is the one that sticks. Yeah, this is a third copy of Great Expectations. I actually really like this cover. I like the color scheme, the like gray. I think it's much more true to the content of the book, presumably. I've actually never read a Charles Dickens book, but I'm very excited to because Don and Tart loves Charles Dickens. I bought a ton of these editions, which you'll see. I think they're like a, they're Barnes and Noble's newer editions. It says Barnes and Noble on the back flap. And for a minute, I really liked these. And then I decided that I, I hated them and I didn't want these editions. So I'm getting rid of all of them. They were pretty cheap. This one was $10. And I'm giving all these books to my local used bookstore. So I'm happy that my neurosis supports local bookstores and local patrons. I hope someone finds these books and loves them. Here are my three copies of Great Expectations. I think the best paperbacks have this like quality. The next book I'm getting rid of is Mountains Beyond Mountains by Tracy Kidder. I bought this at a yard sale for a quarter or 50 cents. It sounds really interesting and I I've, I sometimes dip into these periods where I'm super interested in memoirs and nonfiction, which you'll see later on in this video. I don't know, this book sounds good. I'm just never going to pick it up until I've finished all the other books on my shelf. Both of these shelves are on red or the bottom three are. So I also see this book at nearly every thrift store I go to. So if I ever want it again, it's not like I'm going to have to shell out for it. Oh, this is also a winner of the Pulitzer Prize. I'm sure it's fantastic. If you've read this book, let me know. Maybe I'll like keep the books <laughs> for a little while after I publish this video so I can like be like, oh, 
this person said this book's amazing. I'm very easily influenced. I'm not, you know, like if someone says something's good, I, I hop on. The next book I'm getting rid of is Margaret Atwood's The Testaments. For the longest while, I was dying to read this. I was waiting for it to come out in paperback. I had a good time with The Handmaid's Tale. I thought it was fun. It's very past, it's very fast paced. It's written in vignettes. I normally don't really love a dystopian novel, but I had fun. It was a nice short read. I also remember particularly enjoying the preface to the novel that Margaret Atwood wrote, which was talking about how the novel has been interpreted since its publication. She has this one line where she's like, everyone asks me if this is a feminist novel. And she says, if by feminist you mean it has good women and kind women, but also evil and conniving women, then yes, it is a feminist novel. Or something to that effect. Just that like, I don't know. I, I thought that was very well said. She says it much better than my silly recounting of it, but I enjoyed the book enough to the point that I got this, but I don't think I'm ever gonna read it. I, I don't wanna read a sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, but I do like Margaret Atwood's writing. I'm I saw this ad for like an online writer's workshop. It came up on a YouTube video and it Margaret Atwood is teaching a class. I want to know how much they're paying her, but she sounded very smart. I mean, she is very smart, clearly, from the books. And I do want to read more of her work. I actually have another of her books. I just don't know where it is on my shelf. It's Alias Grace or Elias Grace. I never know how to say it, but I'm really looking forward to that book and I don't think I'll get around to the Testaments ever, so I'm getting rid of it. This is The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. I bought this at a thrift store for 50 cents. It has some really awesome ads in it. Prevention's top belly flatteners. Um, I've said this before, but I get on these really big nonfiction kicks and I'm like, Nonfiction is so cool. I love memoirs. I love science. And then I never end up reading them or I read bits. I actually read, I bought a book from Barnes and Noble recently called, I don't even remember what it was, but it was this like, it's a nonfiction book that studies the psychology of grief. I think that's what it's called. I don't know, but it's published by Yale and the woman who writes it has a PhD or not a PhD. I think she went to med school and she's like a billion years old. So very well established in her field. And I was like, oh, that would be fantastic to read about. Like I want to, I want to get in on that. And then I read like the first 50 pages and it was poorly written. And the like psychology of it was like obvious stuff. You can learn more about human grief and humanity and how it alters people through fiction than you can through a woman who's studied it deliberately for decades, which blows my mind. Um, I've now fully swung back toward fiction and I do not want to pick up any nonfiction books studying psychology. I like exploring people through fiction. Also, fiction is just a refracted reality. All fiction in, in a sense is autobiographical. So it like, you know, it's like real. The Selfish Gene, I don't know. I thought it sounded interesting. I'm never gonna read this book though, so <laughs> I'm being real with myself. The next book is uh, People of the Book by Geraldine Brooks. Almost messed that up. Geraldine Books Brooks. Um, this might be fantastic. I would not be surprised if this is a fantastic novel. I was just tired of looking at it on my bookshelf. I have never once felt inclined to pick this book up. I bought it at a thrift store for a dollar. I bought it because she wrote the Pulitzer Prize winning novel March and I've read quite a few Pulitzer Prize winning novels and I love nearly all of them. Like really love, they've been fantastic. There's one I hate 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 and it's by an author who's in this box because I read that one and I hated it. You'll see in a minute, but um, yeah, she wrote March, which I have, I think. I don't know. If it's a Pulitzer Prize fiction winner I don't have and I find it at Goodwill, I pick it up because I'll eventually read it. If I end up loving March by her, I'll probably buy this book again eventually. I don't know. I have so many books that I just don't see myself ever getting to these, so. This is in the same boat as the Barnes & Noble editions that I decided I hated. I love the graphics on these. I just don't... Something about these editions I just don't love. They all have quotes on the back, which I really love. I'm really excited to read A Tale of Two Cities. I don't think I have another copy, but I see it at 
thrift stores pretty frequently because it's, it's a classic it's widely circulated there are very many editions of it so i'll pick up one of those i think people say they love a tale of two cities so i might read this before i read great expectations another one um, the next few, I think, are these Barnes & Noble editions. They were all very cheap. And I do like, I like the graphics. I don't, I don't know. Something about these books just doesn't click with me. If it's a classic, I don't like these new editions. For the most part, they just kind of... But, I actually kept this one. This was one of the Barnes & Noble editions that I was like, okay, it's hot enough to keep i love the like gray undertone watercolory pastel color palette and the quote on the back is awesome it says why sometimes i've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast amen i'm getting rid of this because i found a super hot copy a vintage copy at a thrift store for 50 cents i'll show it to you uh, here's the copy i really like this copy and it has illustrations inside. I also love how vintage books smell. Like the smell of decaying books might be my favorite smell ever. It's very comforting. It's why I buy a lot of vintage Agatha Christie's instead of just buying them new. Also because the new ones are like $15, but I'll save you my Agatha Christie book rant. Yeah, I like that copy a lot more than I like this one. So I'm getting rid of this one. The next book I'm getting rid of is Withering Heights. I'm actually super pumped to read this. It's also one of the Barnes & Noble editions. I love the quotes on the backs. I wish I liked these editions because I really think that they're beautiful and I understand why they might be super popular. I'll read you the quote. Be with me always, take any form, drive me mad, only do not leave me in this abyss where I cannot find you. The same time I got Alice in Wonderland, I got a vintage copy of it at the thrift store for 50 cents, and I love it a lot too, so. Don't get me started on Jane Austen. I hate her, I hate her, I hate her. I hate Jane Austen, I hate Jane Austen. These are all of my Jane Austen books. I was, um, I don't remember what I was doing, maybe reading a book or just like having a mild breakdown or something, but I was like, I'm never gonna read Jane Austen books. She's actually what inspired this video because I flew to my bookshelf and I was like, I'm never gonna read this. And it was like one o'clock in the morning and I'd been laying in bed and I, took all of her books off my bookshelf and swore off ever reading her. I listened to an hour of Sense and Sensibility on audiobook like a year ago and it was unbearable for me. I think I just hate her and I, I haven't read any of her books. If you like her, all the more power to you. There are a couple of people who I know who like her and I respect their book opinions tremendously. She's just not for me and I feel, I feel vindicated in my hate of her after reading that Virginia Virginia Woolf hated her. The Bronte sisters hated her. I would much rather read Virginia Woolf and the Bronte sisters. And I thought maybe I'll listen to the Jane Austen books on audiobook, but all of the audiobook narrators are unbearable. They're like these 90 year old women who read in old English accents and it drives me insane. I wanna like take my AirPods out and chew on them. Someone also said that Jane Austen's books are like the Brontes minus the like gravity of life and humanity and that they're just like superficial society novels. I don't want to read that. I also feel like E.M. Forster is probably a pretty comparable experience, but like not at all because I love E.M. Forster and think he's completely worthwhile. I mean comparable in the sense that they're like both kind of old Englishy society novels, I think. But I think Forster's brilliant. I think his hot takes on society are brilliant. And I think that they're still relevant today. I'm never going to read Jane Austen when authors like Forster, Virginia Woolf, and the Bronte sisters exist. So I'm getting rid of Northanger Abbey. Hot copy though. Pride and Prejudice. And Emma by Jane Austen. Which I was super excited to read this because I like these editions and I love the cover on the front and I recently learned that Clueless, the movie, is a Jane Austen Emma retelling. That movie's a masterpiece, but I hate Jane Austen so I'm never gonna read these books. Um, I, I'll just watch Clueless again. Um, <laughs> this is 
the Harvard Business Review on decision making. <laughs> Sometimes I feel very silly when I'm out used book shopping. See The Selfish Gene, the book we just got rid of. This is probably one of my s most silly purchases. I just wanted to see, sometimes I'm just like, my interest is really piqued by these. I don't know, these like, who's the, who's the guy who wrote The 48 Laws of Power? Just by these like, modern Machiavellian like, you can do it. Like, you too can be a billionaire. They just really, you know, like I said, I'm easily influenced and they really pique my interest. <laughs> I still have my bookmark in here from, I bought this book years ago and read two. As you can see, I used to use index cards for my bookmarks. I made it to page two. Um, yeah, I have nothing to say about this. I guess other than to harken back to my point that I don't think business, psychology, self-help typey books are really worth it at all. You learn the same lessons in decision making, in grief, in being a good friend, in being a good family member through good fiction. The next book I'm getting rid of is one that for a long time I really wanted to find at a thrift store because I didn't want to buy it new. It's Jeanette Wall's The Broke Courses. <laughs> Half Broke Courses. Pretty cover. I paid like a dollar for this. It was on New York Times Book Review's 10 Best Books of 2009. I had to read The Glass Castle, which is Jeanette Walls' memoir, when I was in high school, and I loved it. I think everyone who I've talked to who's read it has loved it. This is a memoir, not a memoir. I never know which classification to use, really. I think memoir is like a specific time period of your life. Autobiogra autobi autobiography is like very just like chronological and like this is what happened. This is a biography of her grandmother, I want to say, who was featured in The Glass Castle. She was very rich and their father squandered the mansion and let it rot, I'm pretty sure, but I recommend The Glass Castle if you want a fun, fast-paced memoir. I mean, it's like sad, but also happy because they end up flourishing. Elizabeth Taylor? Isn't that the like famous actress in Breakfast at Tiffany's? This is The Girls in the Garden by Lisa Jewell. I bought this at a thrift store. Most of these books I bought at thrift stores, meaning that the threshold for my interest and desire to read the book was a lot lower because they were all very cheap. So I'd rather pay 10 more dollars and read a book that I really, really want to. Paying 50 cents is no excuse to read a bad book instead of a good one. I've read another book by Lisa Jewell. It was... I don't remember what it was called. Clearly it wasn't very memorable. It was a bit silly. She writes thriller books and I really want to find another thriller author I love. I love Gillian Flynn. I love Dan Brown. I said this in my last video, but I can't find thriller books that I don't find corny and annoying. So I'm getting rid of this because I didn't love her other book. I mean, they're fine. I don't even know how to say the name of this book, but I see it at every Goodwill I go to. It's a World War II retelling. I hate historical fiction. And there are so many primary texts on the Holocaust and World War II that I, I'm never gonna reach to pick this up. We have Night by Elie Wiesel and Frank's Diary. I recently, it's not even recent, it was like two years ago at this point or three, but I read The Choice by Dr. Ava Edith Edgar eager. I can never get the order of her name right, but it's called The Choice, and it's about a woman now, but young girl then, who was released from Auschwitz and went on to become a therapist in America. And I thought it was a beautiful story. If you're looking for a self-help book that isn't preachy or out of touch, read that book. I've also read All the Light We Cannot See, and I love that book, and I, I don't, I just don't need another World War II fiction book, and I hate war. Oh, a passage from that book, The Choice, that I think about pretty often is the author explaining that trauma isn't a trump game, it's not comparable, that grief isn't. She has clients now and she talks about how one person's spouse or they are dying of cancer or something of equal life-changing gravity and how her client is very distressed and very upset and how she has another client who came into her office sobbing because her Mercedes was delivered in the wrong shade of champagne beige or something like that. And she explains how grief isn't 
it, it's not a competition and it's just not comparable. You can't dismiss someone else's experiences because you feel that yours are more distressing. And that really stuck with me. I think she's very smart and well spoken. On to another silly nonfiction book. This is Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. I think I bought this book when I was in high school or over the pandemic or I don't know. It's been some years. I remember when Malcolm Gladwell was all the rage. I've seen a lot of mixed reviews. I actually did read a portion of it and I was like, oh yeah, here's another index card that just fell out. I read to page 48 and I was like, cool, interesting. It talks about how like hockey players are most likely to be born in certain months in Canada or something like that. But I'm kind of off the pseudoscience train and I'm not interested in reading, I don't know, just nonfiction books. I, I really do enjoy fiction and I think it has more to teach us than most nonfiction books. The next book is All the Pretty Horses by Cormac McCarthy. And I've heard people love this book, like swear by it. It's their favorite book. And this is the Pulitzer Prize one I was talking about earlier. He also wrote The Road and that's one of my least favorite books I've ever read. I hated that book. I don't know if I'll end up making a video on my least favorite books of all time because that would be very contentious, but I hated that book. It's in one of my reading vlogs if you wanna hear my thoughts on it. I think it's Jeanette McCurdy recommended it. So I read it. It's just so bad and it made me feel awful. Watch the video if you want to know my in-depth thoughts, but I've also read No Country for Old Men. We had to read that in high school. Cormac McCarthy is very like American and like the West and ranching and horses and violence and stuff like that. And I'm just not like a good old American boy when it comes to reading. And I don't, I don't want to read another Cormac McCarthy book. So I'm not going to. I wish that I'd read this book before the other two because I feel like it has the most potential for me to like it, but I'm not reading a third book from an author who I really don't like. The next book is Bell Canto by Ann Patchett. I'm actually really thrilled to read this book. A lot of her older books have these horrendously ugly covers. If you didn't know, authors usually don't get a say in how their cover looks. She actually talks about this in a collection of essays, well, in one essay that is contained within a collection of essays called These Precious Days. Really good essay collection. I love Ann Patchett. I think her writing's great. I love her stories. It's still surprising to me that I've only read one of her books, which is The Dutch House. It's one of my favorite books of all time. I've also read the essay collection. Bel Canto was kind of her breakout book, but I think The Dutch House really catapulted her to literary stardom, if you will. It was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. It's worth all the hype. I got rid of this book because, uh, I got another edition of it. Ann Patchett lives in Nashville and she owns a bookstore there and she has a whole like display of her books. I've never been, but my friend uh, goes to Nashville pretty frequently and she brought me back. All of the books are signed. She brought me back a signed copy of Bel Canto in a much sexier edition. So I'm getting rid of this like, beat up weirdly stained one I got at Goodwill and I'm still excited to read the other edition which is right here. It's the like metallic blue. It's just a lot prettier. Okay I'll show you. This edition is just so so much better than this. She's been reissuing, I think, a lot of her covers, like Lily King. I think both of them had breakout success in relative recent history and have thus gained more of a say in how the book covers look. Anne Patchett explains that now that she's, like, very famous, she gets more of a say. She has a book coming out this fall, which I am beyond thrilled for. It's called Tom Lake, I want to say, and the cover's beautiful. Like, you can tell that she's now getting a say in her books. But yeah, Bel Canto. And it's signed. It's Sapiens, A Brief History of Mankind. This book came out like, I don't know, 2019, 18, something silly like that, 2015. I remember when this book was blowing up and I was like, that's so cool. I love nonfiction. I love people. And it was like, it's reviewed by like Bill Gates and Barack Obama and the New York Times. I'm never gonna read this book. Like I said, I think fiction has a lot more to teach us about humanity than nonfiction. Let me know if you've read this book. Another silly nonfiction book, How Not to Be Wrong with the Power of Mathematical Thinking. This is another one of those like super popularized pseudoscience-y type. It's probably, it's not, I don't, I don't know if it's pseudoscience. Bill Gates also loves this book, of course. Bill Gates, and he loves 
He just loves a nonfiction book. I feel like Bill Gates has never heard of either of these books and he has like a publicist who's like, yeah, that would be good for PR. You should like that book. Let's tell them you like that book. And then you get like blurbs on the front and these like capitalist businessman diehard wannabes are like, yeah, 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 I wanna be just like Bill Gates. And then they like pick up these books, which wasn't entirely me, but also it wasn't entirely not me. But the next book is How to Be Alone. <laughs> It's nonfiction. It is a memoir. It's from my memoir phase years ago. I like the cover of this book. The only reason I bought it is because I was on eBay buying books and I found a book I wanted and I looked at the author's, not the author, I looked at the seller's other items and they had this book and I was like, sure, I'll like support them because the book I was getting was only a few dollars and then I wouldn't have to pay shipping on the second book and they could make a bit more money too. So I bought this and have never felt any inclination to pick it up, but I really like the cover. Down to the last two books. This is called Freedom by J.C. Dugard. It's the follow-up to her memoir, A Stolen Life, which I love. I think it's very good. It's about J.C. Dugard was kidnapped when she was a very young girl and then released, I think at least a decade later, which is insane and crazy, obviously. Really good, I highly recommend it. I don't know why I don't hear more people talking about it. This is called My Book of Firsts. So it's like after she's released from captivity, she's doing all these things that she's never done before. And for a while I really wanted to read this, but then I was like, I think I'll let A Stolen Life kind of stand on its own as it maybe should in my mind. A Stolen Life examines grief and how captivity changes you. And her mindset in captivity is really interesting. She has two children with her kidnapper and she keeps the children and raises them after she escapes captivity. She kind of explores this brainwashing that she experiences with him and why she doesn't try to escape at a certain point. It's very interesting and I like her. I recommend A Stolen Life. It's very short. I don't know. If, if someone's read this and l thinks it's fantastic, I would probably pick it up because it's very short. The last book on this list I bought years ago when it like first came out, it's a hardback. It's Small Fry by Lisa Brennan Jobs. This is Steve Jobs' daughter, the founder of Apple, but Steve Wozniak was the brains behind it. I used to be pretty obsessed with Steve Jobs. Walter Isaacson came out with a memoir when I was in like middle school, I wanna say. And I went to a book signing and met him and got a signed copy of Steve Jobs, which is at my parents' house on my bookshelf. I was at summer camp, I read how half of it. And then when I got home, I just never ended up picking the book up again, but I learned a lot about Apple and I thought it was cool. <laughs> um, I don't care about, I don't care about his daughter who he like disowned and was like, no, I, you're illegitimate. I don't know who you are. And then like named a computer Lisa, but still didn't like claim his child as his own, which he later did because she is his child. I just don't care. And there are other books I'd much much rather read, which is the like refrain that I've tagged after pretty much every book in this video. But it's the truth. Some of these books seem mildly interesting. There are just so many other books that I really, really want to read and I'll never have the time to. So I'm getting rid of these books. I want to get to the point where I've read all the books on my bookshelf and I can just go to a bookstore, pick up a book and be like, I'm reading that when I get home which I do anyway sometimes, but I think it'll feel even better when I have no unread books on my bookshelf. So I'm getting rid of these to help me get one step closer to that. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it gave some insights into my reading habits and what I like to read. That was redundant. Those are the same things. Um, yeah, like if you want, subscribe if you want, drop a comment down below. Let's beef about the books I'm getting rid of. Yeah, that's it. Cheers. Okay, that's all for now. See you soon. You dirty pervert.